let's take out our Bibles and learn together. We're going to begin with a very important test. And that test is to reveal whether you are a believer or not. The Bible is very clear. When someone accepts the gospel, the Holy Spirit, he enters into that person and they become a new creation in Messiah. And what does the scripture say? All these former things are no more. They pass away. Behold, all things are new. And part of what is new is our mind. We live now with the renewed mind. Now, does that mean that we are always perfect? No, we still are in this body. We still can grieve the Holy Spirit. We can live rebelliously at believers, but we're not going to know peace when we're doing that. We're not going to have joy when we're doing that. And I can attest that when one is in disobedience, they are not going to be comfortable in their relationship with God, and that will bring them soon to repentance. In other words, a true believer is going to want to agree with God. When the Word of God says something and it's clear, it's understood, we are going to agree with God. Why would we want to disagree? Why would we think that we know better than God? Now, I say all of this because we're going to be dealing with a very important subject. One, that for the most part, the vast majority of believers in the world do not accept this. And it's tragic. Because when we don't agree with God, what we're saying is this. I am comfortable in my disobedience. I am not accepting what your word says. And again, a true believer cannot be comfortable with that. That is a manifestation that they have not received the truth of God's word, and specifically the gospel. Now, what is the issue that we're going to be dealing with? Whether it is acceptable for a woman to be teaching over men. In other words, for a woman to be a pastor of a church, for her to teach a mixed group of individuals, both male and female, for her to have that teaching responsibility. And the Word of God is very clear about this. Now, we are doing a study of the book of Romans. And we're now ready for that last chapter, chapter 16. And in chapter 16, there is a woman. Her name is Phoebe. And what we know about her is that she was used by God and that she was a servant of God. We can even use that word minister. But not nothing in this passage reveals that she was the leader of a local congregation, a local church. All it says is that she was of assistance to many other people, including the Apostle Paul. Nothing in this section of Romans 16, these first few verses where she's mentioned and alluded to, nothing says that she's teaching, that she's a preacher, that she is doing any of the things that today, unfortunately, in many congregations, women are doing. Now, it's interesting because I want to us to be referred to two places of Scripture. And the two places that I want us to be referred to first is 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 33, 34, and 35. What does it say there? It says that, that women in the local congregation should be in silence. Now, does that mean they cannot converse with one another, that they cannot praise God in song? It does not. When we look at this word in this context, it's a word of inquiry. It's an argumental word. Now, we need to understand that the word of God comes to us within a context. And in the churches in the past, and in the synagogues in the past, and even today, 
when things are being taught it's not so much like it is today where it's more of a lecture where one person speaks and everyone else hears that's how it is today but it wasn't back then there was much in regard to questioning arguing and what paul is saying here realize he's talking about something in first corinthians 14 that needs to be done in the order of god and therefore when it comes to the time of teaching and debating and questioning and such during that time the word of god says not me but the word of god says that women should be silent and if they want to know something if they have a question then at home they should ask their own husbands if they're not married they can make an appointment with a a leader with an elder with a deacon with that with that preacher there and discuss these things but not in a public way where there's arguing why well it can bring disorder it can bring hard feelings so this is what the word of god says now there's a second place i want us to be referred to a very important place and it's found in first timothy chapter 2 and here again beginning in verses uh, 10 11 12 and continuing on we find that that paul is instructing young timothy heading up congregations and he says this i do not permit look at verse 12 i do not permit a woman to teach or to usurp that is to challenge the authority of a man meaning god's positioning of a man in this role it ought not to be done now it's very clear when we look at these passages in first corinthians 14 and in first timothy chapter 2 there's nothing confusing they are rather clear now people will say all the time well that was then things in culture have changed women have a different different thought and a different position today than they did back then well that may be true but that's not what the word of god gives as a reason it's not limited to time why well when we look at for example verse 13 it tells us it tells us that the man was created first and then the woman based upon genesis chapter 2. and furthermore we see in the next verse verse 14 we see that the woman in the garden of eden was deceived not the man so it's a consequence of two things one the man was formed first and secondly we see the woman was deceived now is god free to you is he sovereign is he really god that if he says i do not permit a woman to speak in the local church in this context of arguing and debating passages publicly i do not permit her to teach in a a formal way over men does god have the right to instill that in order to maintain the order that he wants and is it permissible for god to say because the woman was deceived in the garden one of the consequences is that she not teach over men and then we see something else in the scripture that same passage we see that the word of god came out of man god put it in and he gave it out but the word of god only came to women so it came out of man and to women all of this is the biblical reason for god stating i do not permit and paul wrote it down i do not permit for a woman to teach or to usurp the authority of a man as a pastor preacher and such now i say that because people will look and i would invite you now to take out your bible and look with me to romans 16. we're going to look at the first few verses and it deals initially with this woman phoebe and people will use this passage totally against what is said here 
taking it out of context and adding things and interpreting things that are not there in order to justify, hear this, to justify their own desire and to try to, to also justify their rebelliousness. What's rebelliousness? I want what I want and I don't care what God says. That's not what a believer says. Now, again, do we all struggle at times with the word of God? Yes. At times, do we fail God and disobey and grieve the Holy Spirit? Yes, we're all guilty. But that should be the exception and not the norm. And this is what it says. Look at verse 1, Romans chapter 6, verse 1. He says, but, meaning there's a new issue that he's dealing with, not continuing on in what he said. He's concluding this epistle, and he says, but I, I commend. Now, literally, it means to stand with. But in, in English, we would use the word, I command to you, Phoebe, our sister. Being, and here's the word, it's simply meaning a servant, someone who ministers. And should women serve? Yes, they should. Should they minister in the name of Messiah? Yes, they should. And there's a variety, a large variety of things that women can do. But this is not the word that is used for being a leader of a local congregation or being in that role as pastor teacher. It simply says that she's a servant. She's a minister of God. And we see here, look carefully, being a servant of the congregation, meaning the church, that was in Kekrania. Now, this is where she served primarily. But she had a ministry, as we'll see in a, minute, in a moment, that goes beyond that. God used her mightily. But nothing here says that she was teaching over men. Paul would not be commending her, asking people, to stand with her, literally what's said, if this was the case. So it is so disappointing that we have clear verses from 1 Corinthians 14, verses 34 and 35, and we have verses in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. All of this, you read that, it's clear. So we shouldn't look at this and read things into the text that's not there in order to justify what we want. That's not what a true believer does. And let me just simply say, there's another popular woman, and she is uh, also on television and such. And she says it this way. This is her justification for usurping the authority that God has given men. She says, well... There's that woman in in John chapter 4 at the well, that Samaritan woman, yes. And she told people about, about Yeshua, about Jesus. Yes, she did, and praise God for that. But this is not what we're talking about. Is it permissible for a woman to share her faith with, with men and women? Of course. Not only is it permissible, it is commanded to do that. But don't you agree that there's a difference between a woman having a a conversation with another woman or even another man about her faith sharing the gospel? That's something totally different than standing in a local congregation in a, a formal position of being the Bible teacher for that congregation. These two things are unrelated. So for someone to say, Oh, I justify my actions as teaching over men because of the Samaritan woman. You know what I would say? Run away from such a woman because she is incompetent in understanding Scripture interpreting. Why would you use a passage where a woman is telling others about an experience to justify having a formal role and a position in a local congregation, in a local church, and doing that what God did not approve of. God did not approve of women teaching and having authority over a men in this, this role of being a preacher or pastor. It's clear.
And when people reject that and people will say, oh, this is a controversial subject. Now, we can see things in the Bible that are debatable. Why? It may not be so clear. We may be able to interpret it in a variety of different ways, but this is not one. When the scripture says, I do not permit a woman to teach over men, it's pretty clear. When we're dealing with that time of teaching that it says, I want women to remain silent, not to engage in this debating, this arguing in a public way. It's clear. And when someone rebels against it, and they're at peace and they're comfortable with that, and they justify that, distorting the word of God, this is a person that, that in my opinion, has not had a true redeeming relationship and experience with the gospel because no one can just walk in continuous disobedience to the word of God and be comfortable with that. So look at our, our passage again, Romans 16, beginning in verse 1. But I command to you, Phoebe, our sister, being a servant of the, the congregation, the church of Kekreia, in order that she, you receive in the Lord. And you do so, it says, worthily, meaning in a proper way of the saints, meaning how saints should receive one another. And, and that you help her in whatever she has need. Now, it says whatever she has need, but there's another word. It's the Greek word pragmati. Now, this is where we get the word pragmatic, which is something that is reasonable, something that is, is sound, proper. So whatever her needs are, in order that you, you receive assistance, she's assisting the congregations. When she comes to you, if she has need of something, you supply that, those reasonable things, those proper things, those things in order that she can be used by God in order to be a blessing. It says here, keep reading, in the verse 2, for also she, and the word many Bibles will say a patron. Now, what it simply means is that she is in the Greek word, is a word which means she has become an extension of something. She adds to. Something's lacking and she fills in. And all the scripture says, and it's a very generic term, that she has become a, a extension to many and to me, myself, meaning this. She has assisted Paul and she has assisted many other individuals in order that the purposes of God, the will of God, the ministry of God is completed, is advanced, goes forth in a powerful and successful way. Now, we see something else. Look again at this same passage, but now let's move on to verse 3. Now, beginning with verse 3, for this next section, we see that Paul is going to, to greet many people. He is going to, to want to lift them up, give them praise for their faithfulness that he knows firsthand. So let's go through several verses where Paul greets, wants them to greet and, and be a, a blessing and welcome them. So he says, look now to verse 3. You greet Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow servants in Messiah Yeshua. Now we've heard of them from the book of, of uh, 1 Corinthians, for example. So we see here these two individuals, this husband and wife, who are also servants of God, who have come alongside with Paul to, in order to further his ministry and to play a part in the role of God. And Paul has been blessed by this couple greatly. Notice what he says. Who in behalf of my soul, now this probably means my life, the very essence of who I am, and probably says as a minister of God. In behalf of my life, their own 
throats. And that's the word. Their own throats they have laid forth, set down. It's a word of them giving sacrificial. Now, putting forth, and this is the word for the throat right here in front. And what it speaks of, them willing to risk their lives in order to further God's call on Paul's life, that ministry. So they were living very sacrificial, and Paul wants them to be greeted, and he wants to recognize them. He says further on in verse 4, the ones that not only I give thanks, not only I alone give thanks, but all the congregations of the Gentiles, meaning the nations, all the congregations outside of Israel is what he's saying. Why? Because this is where they are serving. So he lifts up this couple and the valuable service that they have performed in the congregations and also with Paul. Also, now look at verse 5. He speaks about the, the congregation, that local assembly, that church that is also in their home. So he wants them to, to be also greeting them of that congregation in their home. Second part of verse 5. Greet, and we're going to go through a lot of names here. It says, you greet, and we have the man Epanetos, my beloved. Now, he says, my beloved, which is just a term of endearment at that time, lifting them up as a, a special friend. He says, who is the first of, and depending upon what Bible you have, if you're going through a Bible like the King James, New King James, that is based upon the Texas Receptus, it will have the first in Acacia. But if you're using the critical text, one that puts forth the variants that are different from the Texas Receptus, it will have Asia. So this man that we're speaking of, this one, Epantos, he was the first, probably the first believer in Acacia for Messiah. Verse 6, he says, greet Miriam. Your Bible will say Mary. Greet Mary, who has worked much and again, in the Texas Receptus, it says, for us, but in others, it will say, for you. Verse 7, greet Andronikos and Julian. And notice what he says here about them. My uh, kinsmen, meaning they are fellow Jews. Not only fellow Jews, but also, he says, my fellow prisoners. These being of note, he wants to lift them up for being these prisoners. They are noteworthy, you might say, among the apostles. And also he says concerning these, the ones who were before me in Messiah, meaning they came to faith in Messiah before he did. Now look on to, to verse, verse 8 where it says, greet Amplios, the beloved, my beloved in the Lord, another close friend. Greet Urbanos, our fellow servant in Messiah. Also, Stechis, my beloved. So he's lifting up these individuals in this area that have been a blessing to him, that has helped him, that has served together with him. And he wants this group in Rome to be familiar with them because these individuals, they have worked closely with Paul and they might be coming as well. And they may have contact with them, so he wants them to know them. Look now to the next verse, verse, verse 10, where it says, Greet and pillus the proven in Messiah. So here it's talking about someone who has a powerful testimony, who has literally documented, your Bibles may say proven, but documented himself in Messiah. And greet the ones from the household, now that's the implication, from the household of Aristobulus, verse 11. Greet Herodian, 
my kinsmen, another Jewish individual, and greet also the ones probably from the household of this one, Narcissus, the ones being in the Lord. So those probably from that congregation in his house or his family that are believers. He's, he's commending fellow believers to this group in Rome. Verse 12, greet Tryphonos and Tryphonos, also the ones who have labored in the Lord. Verse 12, second part, greet Presidos, the beloved, who has worked much in the Lord. Here again, pointing out special things about them, what they have done with Paul and for Paul. Verse 13, greet Rufus, the chosen one in the Lord, just emphasizing him, and his mother and mine meaning Paul had a close relationship with this woman, the mother of Rufus, like it was almost as it was his own mother. Verse 14, Greet Asugritos and Plagon and Hermas, Patrobos, Hermes, and the ones, the brothers, and this means brothers and sisters that are with them. Greet as well Philogonsos, and Julian, Nerea, and his brother. Now, some will say her brother, but it's better his brother. And also Olympus, and also the ones, all the saints that are with them. Greet one another with a holy kiss. Greet the congregations in Messiah. Some will say all the congregations in Messiah. Now, you greet all all those congregations in Messiah. So Paul in this first part of Romans 16 lays out an important truth that we should be respectful of those servants, fellow servants that God uses, greet them, welcome them, help them, assist them in doing the work of the Lord. Well, I'll conclude now until next week when we do the second part of Romans 16 and we conclude our study of this epistle.